So this morning we're going to be talking about 1 Corinthians 11, 17 through 34. It's got an interesting title, uh, but it was really just the title that popped to mind when you read it. Social snobbery at the Lord's table, uh, because that's what they're dealing with uh, in this moment. So it's important to remember that I believe Paul's overall aim uh, in principles is order, submission, and respect in our worship gatherings. We talked about that a little bit last week. I told you that chapters 11 through 14 have that particular focus. What unifies those chapters is a focus on corporate worship and what happens when believers gather together. And while the issues of head coverings and all of those things that we talked about last week uh, you know, probably weren't as widespread uh, as some other problems, including this one. I think even the way he opens uh, by talking about the fact that in, uh, in verse 2 of chapter 11, he says, I'm pleased that you remember the things that I brought you. He kind of commends them. And then we get to this section of Scripture, and he says he cannot commend them, uh, which means it's probably a bigger problem. It's something that he finds to be a more important and the, the Corinthians, to him, were making a mockery of the Lord's Supper by using it out of context and with a wrong heart. And his comment about not commending them reveals just how important he saw that. So I'm going to pray for us. We'll read our verses for today and jump into our message. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we, we gather every week on Sunday morning. We come in here. We Probably a lot of us sit in the same seats that we did last week and sit around the same people that we do each week. And it can be really easy, Lord, for this to slip into some social gathering and we can forget about you. Lord, if we're not careful, the center of the universe becomes us instead of you and who you are and what you've done. And as we look at these verses, Lord, we're going to see a group of people that have allowed their social status or their prominence or something else to override their respect for you, their reverence for you, their understanding of your words when you call us to unity and to edify one another. Because, Lord, we're sinful people. And without a proper focus on you, we will immediately and almost inevitably turn the focus to us. So help us, Lord, as we study these verses, as we worship through song and prayer, Lord, to make sure that our hearts are centered on you. That the life of Christ is the life we seek to live, to bear witness to. And Lord, I just pray that today as we study these words, that you bring conviction where it's needed, edification where it's needed, and Lord, you help us to remember that it's all about Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 1 Corinthians eleven seventeen through 34 but in the following instructions, I do not commend you. Because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part. For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you might be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat, for in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry and another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat or drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. 
For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment about the other things. I will give direction when I come. He had heard, he says in verse 17, he leaves his kind of direction of answering questions and turns again to a part that he's been hearing about. Somebody has told him about the divisions that are going on inside the church and about the way that they're treating one another. He had heard about divisions at the Lord's Supper and he responds here. The discussion of the Lord's Supper has four major movements. First, Paul is scandalized by the action of the rich at the supper for their eating and drinking while the poor remain hungry, 17 through 21. He cannot praise them for holding to the tradition since their meetings are quite outrageous. Indeed, the congregation is divided between the rich and the poor. The social elite are mistreating the poor, and the divisions have some benefit only in the fact that they reveal genuine believers in the community by those who act right instead of acting wrong. The Corinthians claim to be partaking of the Lord's Supper when they have their fellowship meal, but Paul says it is most certainly not the Lord's Supper that they're engaging in because the social elite are gorging themselves on food and drink while the poor are going hungry. Paul is outraged for in behaving in such a way the rich are shaming the poor and despising God's congregation. Thus, Paul cannot praise them for their actions. Instead of edifying the body, it was much more like the snobs had come together and were shunning those who didn't have as much as they had. When you look at this part, he's saying basically, to a degree anyway, the circus had kind of come to town. They came together and had all this vitriol and celebration. But they didn't involve everybody. They didn't even invite everybody. They certainly had groups that they seemed to belong to. I remember in 2001, about three years before I was saved, uh, my wife talked me into coming to church with her. Uh, she had been saved that year and was uh, studying with a group of women. And I went, and the church was a lot like high school. And there was like the A crowd over here and the B crowd over there and the C crowd over there. And I just didn't have any use for it. That's why it was three years before I went back to church. Because it was, I survived high school once. I didn't want it again. And if we're not careful, we'll do that. We'll group up in our little packaged groups. And the next thing you know, we have no care at all for those who don't have what we have or don't run where we run or don't say what we say or wear what we wear or whatever it is. So he's chastising them. Because when they were getting together for these meals that they were you know, saying was the Lord's Supper, they were just acting like snobs. It's a, a great kind of a chastisement for us, too. We have to be careful so that we don't treat these gatherings in the same way. Because they had gotten to a place where it wasn't for the better. It was actually for the worse. They were drawing the distinctions and making it even harder for people who didn't have as much to feel like they were a part of the body of Christ. Their behavior was anything but indicative of the way the church or a believer should act. That's why he says, I cannot commend you. 
That's why he says it twice, actually, in these verses. But he also tells them that it was not without benefit. Even trouble can teach us something. In this instance, it revealed the true nature of some people's faith. He says, there had to be divisions among you so that those that were approved would stand out, effectively, is what he's saying. And what he means by approved is those people whose faith proved to be genuine, who truly were following Christ, who were treating each other the way that Christ had called them to do so. They would stand out in a crowd of snobs. And he says, it has benefit. We see it come out. It's revealed. Testing has its attributes. For instance, fire reveals fortitude. We we know this when it comes to steel. We know it when it comes to certain things that are talked about in the Bible. Even in like 1 Peter 1, 7, it says, So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor, at the revelation of Jesus Christ, sometimes it's good for there to be some division and trouble inside of a church because it reveals to you the people whose heart is truly for Christ, who truly are pursuing the right things. I will say that that's not so that we invite trouble. It's so that you understand that even in trouble, God has plans and purposes and reasons for the why and where And oftentimes it is this fire that tests us. When you think about it from a different standpoint, it's like workouts. Some of you know I go to CrossFit. I know it doesn't always look like it. I keep thinking I'm going to do one workout and I'm going to be 6'4 and 320 pounds. It just never seems to happen. But workouts are worth the pain for the gain of health and strength. That's why you do them. That's why you put yourself through them. And oftentimes, as a church, there are going to be times where we're going to go through struggles and trials. And the reason we go through those is to strengthen faith, to reveal it, to help us to understand it, and to be able to to see the places where we need to grow. Fire reveals fortitude. Workouts reveal strength and health. Trials reveal faith and confirm it. And For each of us, all of us can say we believe all kinds of things, but it's when pressure comes that we find out what we really believe and what we don't. There's even a medical term for that, fight or flight, right? It's a mechanism that kicks in when somebody is having some kind of a major episode, a heart attack or something else, or... It can just be because you're in a very stressful or high-pressure circumstance. And some people run and some people turn and fight. And, and for us in the faith, we need some times of pressure, some times where things don't go the way we thought they would so that we find out whether or not our faith is really strong. So it's, it's not without benefit that they were having these troubles because in some instances they were seeing people come out of it that had a genuine faith, that we're truly committed to living out Christ in front of others and with others. But he wanted to remind them that Christ's sacrificial life should be their aim. They were coming together to eat and to celebrate and have fun with one another, but they had forgotten what the Lord's Supper was really all about. The Lord's Supper was about Christ giving up his life for us, the act of Christ breaking his body for them and for us. It's so easy to take that for granted, especially when we have things that we do on a week-to-week basis or actions that we go through. If we're not careful, we just, they become white noise almost and We don't think about the fact that we're coming into a worship service. We call it a worship service because we intend to come and worship. But we'll lose that. It'll become white noise because we're caught up in the social aspects of it or we're caught up in the traditional aspects of it or we're caught up in whatever. I mean, there are people that sometimes struggle to worship during a Sunday because someone sat in their seat which tells us that we have something that we're forgetting. We're we're losing sight of what we're here to celebrate. 
And Christ's body was broken for us. We're here to worship Him because of that. Christ's blood was spilled for them and us. You may have forgotten those two things, the, the punishment that Christ's body took as a result of our sin and the covering we now have because of the blood of Christ. We watch some shows on Discovery Channel sometimes. It always amazes me when people are out in the, you know, in the middle of nowhere. One of the first things they do is rub mud all over them to keep bugs from biting them. and It's a, a, like a layer of protection. And Sometimes we forget how protected we are by this covering of God's blood, of Christ's blood on our behalf, that, that we have this bridge between us and God that ever expands and gets bigger and bigger the more we realize who He is and who we are. He's telling them, in fact, that self-examination should be a part of what we do in communion and when we celebrate the Lord's Supper. He's not saying it so that we approach that fearfully, it's so that we approach it gratefully. We needed to understand that if we do celebrate the Lord's Supper in a wrong way, he's teaching the Corinthians that they were guilty concerning the body and the blood. And what he meant by that was they had made it into something it wasn't. They had changed the nature of the body and blood. He uses words like mockery. Mockery just means that you, you make fun of it. It means that you are somehow diminishing its value. It's like a painting. If you go buy a painting and you found out later it was a forgery, it's worth nothing. And in this instance, they were making a forgery of the Lord's Supper. They had turned it into something it was never intended to be. And because they had done so, they had made it a mockery. Imagine feeling at Paul's feelings as he hears of these divisions and the way that they were treating one another in the Lord's Supper. And I can imagine why he uses such stern language. I know that most of you that are in here today have either at some point or another surrendered your life to Christ or, or maybe in some instances feel like you have multiple times done that, but but I know what Christ did for me and what He changed. I know what kind of difference He made in the life of uh, my family and the way that the world turned upside down in 2004 when I encounter the person of Jesus Christ. The idea that someone would make a mockery of that insulting it's aggravating it's frustrating it makes the temper that he got rid of I want it to come back it's a mockery and he doesn't want them to he wants them to understand how egregious a thing it is to make the God of the universe a mockery He uses the word arrogance because they really thought it was about them. And they were sure that the reason they came together to celebrate was so they could show off. Look at what I have. Look at all the food we have. Look at all the wine we have. Look at all of whatever. Arrogance had filled the gathering at Corinth and I think it's a particular temptation for the American church. We are rich beyond measure. Something we should be exceedingly grateful for. And most of us are. But if we're not careful, suddenly we will become the snobs that let no one eat at our table. We will become the people who are so arrogant that we really do believe 
that the world revolves around us. It's something they teach people when you're going to go on missions. It's something most of you should learn as we go out into missions. The rest of the world is not America. They don't think like Americans. They don't talk like Americans. And a lot of them don't believe like Americans. But God wants to reach those people. God has a love and a desire and a purpose for their life. Just because they're not like us doesn't make them bad. It just makes them different. We've got to make sure arrogance is not the characteristic of our worship, and particularly when it comes to approaching the table of the Lord. They were self-centered. They just, everything was about them. They didn't want to wait on their brothers and sisters. Why should I wait on them? You can almost hear them. It's my stuff. I brought it. I'm going to eat. And he reminds them, you can do that at home. Don't do that here. This is not about you. The arrogance was making them think it was all about them. Self-centered just accentuated the issue. And the next thing he talks about is self-exaltation, where they were really thinking they knew a lot. If you remember, all the way up to this point, he's been chastising the Corinthians because they think they know everything. They think they have all the answers. They don't really even need any instruction. Even though they're still on milk and they should be at meat, even though they still can't seem to settle small differences between them, they were certainly sure of themselves. He just wants them to be sure of Christ. They had failed to show concern for others. I said last week that the concern throughout chapters 11 through 14 is unity and orderly worship that builds up the body of believers. That's what this whole section is. We get caught up in the little pieces of it. You know, whether or not a, a woman is submissive to her husband or whether or not someone should eat a certain way when they do this or they should exercise gifts or talents in certain ways. We get caught up in all of those little pieces which are tertiary issues to the main point. His main point is the body of Christ should be unified and orderly in the way that it worships their God. We can't forget that that's the main point of these verses and sometimes get too caught up in all the other things. Our worship is not just about us individually. It is also about us collectively. You're here to be built up, to be equipped, to be able to go out and to be witnesses for Christ, but you're also here to edify one another, to build one another up, to provide accountability and encouragement. It's one of the reasons why I think we struggle at times with differences of opinion in the church. I've shared before, but I mean, it's, and it's not new. You can Google it and find it out, but I'm top five reasons in church for why they split and none of them are theological or doctrinal they're decor and music and preaching style and those types of things and it's because we forget that it's not just individually it's collectively so how does the body collectively worship the best not just how do I like it trying to help them remember that it's supposed to be not just individual but collective. You should walk in here with a heart yielded to worship but your secondary goal should be to help others have that same heart. We should want to mirror Christ in all that we do. We should remember that and he wants them to remember that Christ died for them and he died for us. Christ sacrificed for them and for us and Christ intercedes for us he told us elsewhere Romans 8 34 says it really good and succinctly who is to condemn Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that who was raised who is at the right hand of God who indeed is interceding for us 
His point to the Corinthians is we should want our lives and our worship to reflect that. Not our status, not our placement, not our riches, not our any of those things. It, it shouldn't be those things that are the marker. I made the comment when I first moved here that you know, one of the things I do when I move into a new area, even when I was driving, I would go around and ask people about different places. and Like I would ask them, can you tell me how to get to First Baptist Church? And I was really surprised that there was a lot that didn't know how to get to First Baptist Church. Apparently Mercer Street is not the busy place that it used to be and Stafford now seems to be the busier place. But, but the descriptives were interesting too. I mean, I, I met quite a few people that had extremely good things to say about this church. I met plenty of people that had really great things to say about David Dockery, uh, the previous pastor. And then I met people that had quite a different opinion as well. I would say the number one descriptor that I heard about this church in this town when I first got here anyway was, that's the rich church. Because for a long time it was. For a long time there was a certain type of people that seemed to gravitate towards this church. Right or wrong, it became known in the town as that. Part of the reason why we have that mission statement now for the gospel and for the city is because we need to be about telling them that we're not the rich church, we're the blessed church, we're the church of Jesus Christ, we're the ones that are for the gospel and for the city, we're the, we're the ones that are here that we're just as broken, just as in need as they are, and that there's a Christ that's ready to answer those concerns for them. We should want our lives and our worship to reflect that. And for the Corinthian church, they had gotten off track. And, and suddenly their status and their placement became a bigger issue for them than even properly honoring God in the way that they celebrated the Lord's Supper. If they could get off track in that place, imagine how easy it would be to get off that track in lots of other places in life. We talked about the fact in Hebrews, when we did the book of Hebrews, that Jesus is greater. That was kind of the main theme of the entire book, is that Jesus is greater. We need to remember that when we are in the midst of our celebration, when we're in the midst of our enjoyment of our lives and the blessings of it, that we don't forget that of all the things we enjoy on this earth, Jesus is greater. He's greater than those things. And he deserves more honor than the Corinthians were paying him. And sadly, too often, he deserves far more honor than we do. Sometimes we have to look in the mirror and see who's the most important. And at times when we look, we don't see Jesus. We see a we see our needs, our place, our position, whatever it is. And we have to remember that the whole symbolism behind the Lord's Supper was because of legitimate, actual acts. It's not hyperbole that he took bread and broke it because he would, within hours, be broken. It's not just some analogy he uses when he says the wine is blood and that it's going to symbolize the new covenant because hours later his blood would be spilled. It's important that we make it important. Jesus is greater and we should want our lives and our worship to reflect that.